How great is the love that the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God? And that is what we are. Amen. Word of God for our consideration today are uh, words of the gospel lesson as I announced earlier, Matthew chapter 9. Um, let me just uh, take the, the first part of it to get us back into the lesson. Uh, ch chapter 9, verse 9. As Jesus went on from there, he had just healed uh, uh, a man who was paralyzed. It's, that's the account where the, the four men ra uh, put him down through the roof. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the toll booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. This is God's Word. Brothers and sisters in Christ, sometimes a command does more than just tell you what to do. Uh, it, it sometimes almost seems to make you do it. M maybe you've run a race before. Maybe you were in track in some point in your life. And uh, as you're coming down the, 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 the home stretch towards the finish line, the crowd is cheering you along, and people are they're shouting at you, and they're commanding you, right? Run! Go! And as you go along, it's, it's almost as the, though the, the, the urgency and the energy in those voices is, is carrying you along. You, you pick up the pace. You, you don't stop to consider, hmm, now I wonder what I should do when they, pe people tell me to do that. Or, or maybe you've been uh, driving your car, a little bit absent-minded even, uh, down the road, and uh, all of a sudden this person sitting next to you as a passenger uh, hollers, Stop! There on the road is uh, some obstacle, something that might uh, cause great damage to your vehicle, or, or maybe a small animal, or even a small child is darted out in front. And, and you don't use that occasion to pause and, and have a debate about it. Now, should we stop or shouldn't we? But, but the, the, the very command itself almost m moves you to slam on the brakes. In Jesus' ministry, there were these commands that he gave, and there was actually a supernatural power that, that not only said, this is what should happen, but made the thing come to pass. So on the storm, uh, in the storm on the sea, Jesus gets up and he says, quiet, be still. And the wind and the waves obey him and are still. Or, you have Jesus at the tomb of Lazarus. Lazarus, come forth! And out he comes. Or, you have uh, the, the man Jairus, who went to Jesus for help, and then along the way, going back to the house to, to heal his daughter, is told that his daughter is dead. And Jesus says to him, don't be afraid, just believe. And Jairus goes along with him to see his daughter brought back to life. Perhaps Jesus' call to faith could be resisted. But, but there is in that call a force, something that is pulling those who hear it along. We, we have it illustrated any number of times in his uh, earthly ministry. It, it doesn't come so much as an invitation. Would you like to follow me? Or he doesn't bring it up as a topic of discussion. What would you think about following me? But along the Sea of Galilee, he finds Peter. And he finds Andrew at work mending their nets. And he tells them, it's a command, follow me. And they leave their work and they follow him. And here again in the gospel that we have before us today, there's Matthew at the tax collector's booth sitting at his desk or table or what it was. And Jesus looks him in the eye and he gives him the command, follow me. And Matthew leaves his work behind. And he follows Jesus. Jesus is still calling you and me. Follow me. And we still feel 
in the in the command in the word and an urgency uh, a force a power that is pulling us pulling us pulling us along and as we follow we may wonder like Matthew may well have wondered why me so today as Jesus is calling, follow me. With the example of Matthew, we acknowledge that your past may look like a problem. But it is the reason that he calls you. Probably no one, not even Matthew, expected Jesus to be calling him to faith and to discipleship, to follow him on this day. Uh, it would seem to... Uh, Probably Matthew himself, that his past was a problem. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the toll booth, and he said to him, follow me, and he got up and followed him. Uh, Matthew was a publican, a, a tax collector. You remember the tax collectors, right? These are guys who were hated even more than IR, our IRS agents. At least our IRS agents are, are people who are somewhat limited by laws, and uh, with a good lawyer, you could maybe even beat them in court. You had no such thing with the tax collectors of Jesus' day. They were widely regarded as thieves and traitors. They were thieves because they skimmed extra money in order to enrich themselves. Even their Roman bosses we have in history at times criticizing these guys for the way in which they took too much in the taxes and the tariffs. But they let it go, and that's how many of those tax collectors became so wealthy. And, and then to the, the Jewish point of view was the problem that these guys were working for the wrong team. They had allied themselves with the Roman overlords, the occupying force uh, in the land of Israel. And so Matthew was helping to strengthen that empire that the Jews wanted to, to throw off and get rid of. If Jesus, as a Jew, wanted to win friends and influence people, doesn't seem like Matthew was a very wise choice to include on his team. Well, then there's a Ma Matthew himself and his own look at things. You know, what would he get out of following Jesus? He already had what most people, what apparently by his career choices, Matthew was looking for. He had power and he had money. He had money from the riches that he skimmed from those taxes that he collected. We kind of see evidence of that in the dinner that happens later. Following Jesus would be mean that he was going to be giving up uh, designer clothes, gourmet meals, five-star accommodations. What's the good of that? And backing him up was the full force of the Roman Empire, which at the time was the greatest power uh, there was. To follow Jesus was going to be laying that aside, and, and now he was going to be back on the, on the weak Jewish team, but, but worse than that, I mean, if there was a Jew he could have chosen to follow who would make him even less popular than he was as a tax collector for the Romans, it was going to be following Jesus. Those Jewish leaders make that clear in their reaction to the dinner that was going on at Matthew's house. They have no secret of their criticism for Jesus or Matthew here. While he was reclining at the table in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came to eat with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Well, the Pharisees spotted a two-for-one opportunity here. They could judge and shame two different people in this case, both Jesus and Matthew. Never mind that their own behavior was uh, more than a little creepy. I mean, what were they doing spooking around Matthew's house while Matthew's having a dinner party uh, with some friends? Uh, they are not the friendly neighbors who just happened by. They were strangers. And if, if strangers came and intruded themselves on some dinner you're having with friends, it's rude. It's offensive. 
And I don't know anything about Jewish culture that would suggest it would have been any different in Jesus' day. So here's Matthew with his past. And what do we see but, but problems for why should this man be following Jesus, right? Uh, at least three different that uh, we can count. There's the issue of Matthew's own morals. There is the issue of uh, what he gets out of following Jesus considering his wealth, power, position. There is the issue of uh, peer pressure and popularity. Why would he want to follow Jesus? It's beneficial for us, I think, also then to consider that we are less different than Matthew than uh, we might think. Not only our past, but our presence as well. First, look at our morals. Now, we may be tempted to question whether there's any real moral equivalency here because most of us have not lived a life in which we have made ourselves a social pariah by the bad moral choices that we have made. There may be some among us, uh, perhaps it could a little bit more relate to Matthew based on uh, past life and experience, but for the most part, we might question how close that is. And yet, with God, sin is sin. No matter how secret we think we have kept it, or no matter how subtle it might be, it's all the same to him. As I've said before, when it comes to uh, you know, human relationships and how we judge crimes and sins, well, there it may be appropriate that we rank them, because not all of our sins or crimes affect our neighbor the same way. Some are more severe, some less so. And that we, we recognize this and punish them differently, that, that may be appropriate. But that has to do only with our relationship with other people. When it comes to God, every sin, no matter how secret or subtle, uh, wh whether it is uh, self-righteous or uh, just selfish feeling inside the heart, or whether it is a violent crime, it comes down to the same offense. We have in our hearts opposed God. We have chosen uh, evil over good. We have decided that we will defend him instead of living in faith. Now as a pastor, I can tell you that sharp and honest consciences often are fully aware of the problems with their pasts when it comes to their relationship with God, even for those things that may not seem so serious. A, a young woman comes to me who's racked with guilt because she can't forgive her father, who has been a somewhat neglectful parent. Or a young man confesses his deep regret that he failed to stand up, to speak up, to defend uh, a, a person that he saw was being picked on by others. And, and the solution in such cases is not to say, well, it's okay, those are just little sins. No, these peoples have consciences, and their consciences are well aware that they have stood against God in these things. No, the, the, the solution in such cases is uh, rather to acknowledge what has been done wrong and then lead them as quickly to the cross and to the grace of God. And we will have more to say about that in just a moment. But maybe we aren't so different from Matthew in our lives as we might think. Second, we share Matthew's potential problem with wealth. Uh, but I'm not very rich, we might think to ourselves, and maybe by comparison with other Americans, that might be true. But if you ask other people around the world, uh, they may not be so sure. And if you could bring Matthew himself to our day and look at how we live and what we have, Matthew himself might think, oh man, you guys have it easy. Do we realize what a, a unusual lifestyle and high standard of living we have compared to what most people have experienced across time? Uh, I, I know this, uh, an account of a, an evangelist in Central Africa who was retelling the story of the prodigal son. A little bit of a paraphrase, admittedly. But when he came to the part where the younger son takes his father's riches and, and, and runs away with them, he says, and he went off to America to squander his father's wealth in wild living. I know of a, a lady who served a number of years as a missionary in Peru. 
And when her time there was done and she was going to go home, the, the students that she had served came to her and they asked her if her parents were going to pick her up in their airplane because they simply assumed that everyone in the United States must have one. Perhaps following Jesus won't mean that you have to give up your air-conditioned house, your closet full of clothes, your ability to eat out at a restaurant almost any time you want and to eat meat every day. But you recognize those things have not been the norm for most people. And we should realize that the day could come when following Jesus would mean having to say no to some of those quiet luxuries we've been enjoying. Don't underestimate the power of a comfortable lifestyle to present a problem when it comes to hearing Jesus' call and answering it in faith and followership. Third, I don't have to tell you how many morals and values that Jesus taught have fallen out of style in our time. We like to be popular. We don't want to be guilted or, or put to shame for where we stand. And, and uh, uh, not, not to try to excuse or ignore the the pharisaical approach that sometimes many Christians have been guilty of, but if there is any group today in, in our society that is happy to judge and to shame others for their moral life, it would be, in my opinion, those angry activists and secular fundamentalists who have no qualms about not tolerating anybody who does not adopt every feature of uh, the perversions of the sexual revolution that they prefer. When love, real love for others, that is a genuine concern for the physical and spiritual well-being of others, not sex, not enabling, but real love. When that comes under attack from uh, the hyper-moralists on the right or the left, well then we seem to have a problem. A problem for following Jesus, not only from our past but our present. Will we follow Jesus' call or will our desire to be acceptable, to be popular, get in the way? Okay, so these may all look like problems to answering Jesus' call, follow me. We may even wonder whether uh, or why Jesus calls uh, such people at all. But he reveals that it's not a problem, it's actually the reason he calls us. And now when he heard this, he said, that's to Jesus, of course, it's not those who are well who need a doctor, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Well, Jesus answers those who question his call with, again, three ways. An analogy or an illustration, a scripture quote, and then a simple expression of fact or truth. So let's take each one up. First, we have the uh, analogy, the, the illustration to prove his point about the doctor and the patient. Is it, not, it is not those who are well who need a doctor, but those who are sick. Well, you, you might see a doctor yourself for regular checkups. You might see the doctor, but you really need the doctor when there is something wrong, when you are not well, when you're sick or you're injured. There are two doctors that I see in my life on a regular basis, at least annually. One is my internal medicine doctor, and I have to see him every year because about seven or eight years ago, some of you may remember, I had to have half my thyroid removed, and, and that means that he has to monitor where the, uh, the hormone thyroxine is in my blood to make sure it's just within the, the standards. Uh, I will be on a hormone replacement pill for the rest of my life. Uh, in that sense, I'm not well, and I need the doctor. 
Uh, about 25 years ago, I developed asthma, and at least once a year, I have to see my asthma doctor, and he checks out my lung capacity and how I'm breathing, how I've been doing lately, and if necessary, he adjusts my inhalers. Again, I'm not well when it comes to that. I, I need that help, and so I need the doctor. Now, you young people, bah, you may figure, not so much, but your day is coming. And for some of us who are older, well, <laughs> what I just described might be fairly mild by comparison. People who have to go to the doctor much more often because they need much more help, much more medicine. Our, our sin is less like a one-time injury or a temporary illness. It is much more like a chronic condition as I have just described. It's never going away. Though sometimes it may seem we kind of have it under control. And we're always going to need the medicine. Left untreated. It is deadly. Well, the point here is really less about our condition and it is more about the heart of Jesus and what he came to do about it. He's the doctor. He's come to heal us. Our sin didn't drive him away. It was the reason he came. And his life and death created that medicine which provides for us the, 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 the cure for all time for what we have. By his sacrifice, he has neutralized our sin and its deadly danger. Now, not, not only do we not have to worry about its eternal consequences any longer, but even now in our lives, by his grace, by his forgiveness, it no longer can assert its control over us. But, we still carry the germ, and we still suffer outbreaks with us, at least this side of heaven. And so Jesus continues to feed us the medicine. We, we continue to get new doses of it, right? Uh, some of those doses, most of those doses we take by ear. Every time we hear the gospel in God's word, the grace of God is being applied to us for our sin sickness. Some of those doses we take by mouth when we come forward and receive the Lord's Supper and they're given for you for the forgiveness of your sins. One time in your life you get a topical dose applied to the skin at your baptism. But in each case, Jesus continues to provide the, the medicine of life, the medicine of eternity in the forgiveness of sins so that we might have what we need. And then far from being an obstacle, a problem for following him, it is the very reason for which we've received that call for ourselves and others. Second, Jesus supports this all with a quote from the prophet Isaiah. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Well, this is as much directed at human behavior as it is uh, this opening up of the great heart of God, the that the Pharisees, of course, made much of the fact that they carefully lived their lives according to the law of God when it came to their worship practices. You know, they did their worship just right. They followed all the rituals just right. They made the sacrifices on time and in the way that God demanded. This was a problem with the Old Testament people. Well, not a problem, you might think. I mean, they, they at times did the same thing, and yet God had to confront them. The problem was this, that while they did all this external worship life correctly, they didn't care about other people. And, and that turns God's priorities upside down. It's not that God is unconcerned about our worship practices. He, he definitely wants a worship that makes His grace the big thing, that brings His forgiveness to us on a regular basis. That's the medicine of life. But when we don't care enough about other people, to share that medicine of life, who, those people who need it in their sin as well, when, when we, we don't love our neighbor in such a way, when we, we aren't concerned whether they actually know God, that's the other concern that Hosea mentions uh, in this context. Well, there's a problem. 
but not with Jesus. Because this is what he came to do. He wants to care about us, to show us mercy, to save our souls. To see the great heart of God. It's what he shows to us and why our sins did not stop him from calling us. Finally, he makes this simple, clear statement of purpose. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. That's not true because Jesus likes sin. He doesn't like sin. It is true because there aren't any righteous people. At least not before Jesus forgives them. And so, here he is, in his purpose. And we can appreciate and lay claim to that promise for ourselves, and then we can follow him by doing what we can to share that promise with others. Following Jesus starts with trust and faith. We're going to need that in order to go where he's leading. But then we need to understand that that's not the whole thing about following him. It's more than an attitude in our hearts. It's more than an idea to which we hold. It's more than a feeling that we have. For Matthew, it actually meant literally that he was going to travel where Jesus traveled and eat and sleep and work where Jesus was. For you and me, it means that we become Jesus' hands and his feet and his mouths in service to him as we live out our faith. Jesus is calling you to follow him. That was not a mistake. It is not a mistake. You are just the kind of person he is looking for. Amen. Please stand.